I'm pleased to introduce uh, Sebastian Ekosh as our SAP for Environment and Sustainability. He's going to give us a short presentation this morning, followed by the Q&A. And when we get to the Q&A, I'll ask you to state your name and the name of your media address as well, and then I'll ask you a question. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Over to you. Yes, good morning. Uh, I'll take this statement. Yes, good morning. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you to be with us uh, this uh, very early morning. I hope you enjoyed yesterday. Or yesterday evening, or the fact of being here may, may mean that you didn't enjoy it, you left earlier. So uh, I'm curious to have, uh, uh, to have the feedback. Uh, we have uh, prepared, and I have, so first of all, uh, Nicola works with us in communication. I have Michael Schneider, who is my assistant director for, um, we call it EcoHub program. So Michael is running all of the, uh, the data driven uh, products. Quentin Holder, who will be joining us in a second, is also in my team and he's in charge of um, the uh, IATA environment assessment, which is one of our key programs in, in helping airlines uh, uh, just go through all the environmental processes, which is, which is a little the approach to, to safety. We have the same approach now to uh, environment. So I have actually um, eight slides that I'll, I'll, I'll share with you, which are a form of update uh, of what we, uh, what happens since uh, since October uh, last year, and actually, uh, so I'll start I'll start with this because the, the you know the main message is uh, that we we have had what we call this this uh, historic uh, resolution uh, and special resolution on uh, net net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But we are actually, I just calculated, eight months and 17, uh, 17 days uh, after this resolution, because of the COVID uh, disruptions, we didn't have a normal timing in between the uh, uh, two assemblies. But what I wanted to walk you uh, through are the, just four, four points very quickly, is what is the tipping point of momentum, we believe, that starts picking up on, on sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, our position, of course, on uh, Corsia and the long-term aspirational goal. In the, the new topic, it's not a new topic, but a topic which is which is emerging, which, which I would like to attract your attention to, which is related to um, plastic, or rather deplastifying how aviation wants to get rid of single uh, single-use plastic. Let me start by just reminding you uh, of a slide uh, which 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 we keep showing repeating and which is our uh, our current status our plan of what we want to achieve by 2050 so of course the the, the, the this this decarbonization mix has not changed since eight months uh, uh, it's uh, it's it's our plan for 2050 1.8 gigatons of co2 this is what is going to be the challenge that we need to meet debate by 2050 and of course the mix when I when I say that the carbonization mix has not changed so not surprisingly eight months after the resolution 65% of our decarbonization um, ambition uh, will come from sustainable aviation fuel and even though if we talk a lot about it I still would like to um, to, to remind you that we, we put 30% of our um, attention and of our plan onto the new technologies, 3% from operations and 90% from offsets. And I'm going to talk about it because offsets are, of course, met Corsia, and Corsia this is one of the main topics of the trade and assembly, uh, uh, which is happening in October, uh, in October this year. The last one on that slide is, we promised that we will be doing this. This decarbonization mix in percentages potentially new additional technology is going to evolve, but when we evolve it, we need to have much more knowledge than we have uh, about each, each component of the, uh, of the decarbonization uh, mix. Now, in October, we, we mentioned that uh, staff is, is the, the, uh, the most important element of uh, our decarbonization, and actually, on that slide, I wanted I wanted to, to attract your attention to two uh, two elements which basically happened in between October and uh, and today. So first is that we started having 
much more attention from government on the stuff production which we requested to be backed by the proper incentives. Here, you know, we, we, we ask for those incentives and I would like to clarify, not for airlines, we don't want to get money from governments, but we want to convince governments that they should incentivize producers, existing and new producers, to come onto the market. Again, the, the, the I mean, it's, not, it's not again, but the, the, the fact is that our biggest issue uh, is on the supply side. We, 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 we have a technology which wants to represent 65% of our emission reduction, as, as on the slide. Uh, the reason being that we know this technology. It's a drop in fuel, so you can use existing engines. This is also very important to keep underlining. It does not need any investment from airlines. When we have some, we blend it. Today, the limit of the blend is 50%. We put it in the engines, we can, uh, we can use it. So we have two contrast policies. We have the incentive policy, which, which was uh, introduced by the uh, Biden administration, which gives a tax credit system to, to the fuel producers, and which we are very supportive of. And of course, a technology which for us is not the most efficient and dilute environmental benefits, which is uh, mandate, because you can mandate to use something when the supply exists. When there is an issue with the supply, it's very, very difficult. Uh, it, it just puts pressure on cost, but not pressure on, on, uh, on investment. The last element of that slide is that with effective governments, uh, we, we, we believe that by 2030, unlike what we were saying in October, not 23 billion liters, but 30 billion liters of sap could be uh, supplied on the market by 2030. We just track all the projects, we track the announcements, we track the offtake uh, off announcements by airlines to, uh, to see if the evolution of the supply is enough and how to promote, inspire more of this uh, uh, availability. And the, the good point in that is that we are at the momentum on some. And, you know, it's uh, always uh, challenging for us uh, to, to, to do projections. So what we can do is to evaluate our, our projections based on all the announcements, on based on how the, how the market uh, 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 behaves. And there are good news on that. Actually, those good news comes also since October. Uh, we estimate that before 2025, at the maximum by 2025, and I have a list, we have 10 plus plants which will be able to deliver 5 billion liters annually, which is uh, exactly um, 50 times more than we use today. So of course, I keep hearing, and it is right, it's not wrong, that SAF is a great technology, but the usage is minimal. And that's absolutely the reality. The reality is that we are below 100 million liters in 2021. We created this industry representing the Sayaka, representing the industry, a demand point. He said, this is our main interest, this is our main, 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 main decarbonization. We continue to give this demand signal to the market. The answer is, again, picking up, there is momentum, and we believe that, as I mentioned, we, we could reach 30 billion meters with the right policies uh, uh, by, uh, by uh, 20, uh, 2030 with uh, an important element, which is um, the number of flights that could have used, uh, that would be used as but also 11 te technical pathways. And I'm going into those details because very frequently we have the question, okay, it's great that you have some, it's great that this is an existing technology, but what about the feedstock? Actually, the answer to that is that we have two generations of SAF, first generation, second generation, but also what we have is we have a lot of money invested currently in research to bring new technologies, new technological pathway of producing SAF. And when you hear about those announcements, this is a very good sign. We, we, we follow some projects directly, some projects we just know that our research institute is working on that. In 2025, we believe that there could be 11 technical pathways approved, while today we have seven uh, approved pathways. It's extremely important to us because, again, when a pathway is approved, that means that you can take the sap that is produced from the pathway, blend it with uh, conventional fuel, and
and send them directly to the plains. There is no once the, 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 the staff crosses the border um, the plains of the airport, it is considered the same fuel as we use it today. Therefore, from safety perspective, from standard perspective, having additional pathways just increases the, the supply of something which the output has to be exactly as we have uh, as we have uh, today in, in our plate. The element I would like to attract your attention to on that side, and this is one of our biggest challenges as, as industry and of course as association, is the extremely uneven distribution of the projects on the map. And this, this is very symbolic, this is to simplify the, the message, but actually there are literally zero projects in Africa of heavy sub, uh, sub production, and we have one sub uh, currently uh, project which is in Paraguay uh, in Latin America. Why we have most of the projects concentrated today, there's a huge number of projects in Europe, and there is a huge number of projects in the US. In the US, there's also a lot of announcements which are due to by the incentive administration on, uh, on taxes. So, <coughs> this is why we have the bullet point on the book and claim system. Because if we want all of our airlines, which is 290 airlines, to have access to SAF, we need to give them the freedom to buy SAF at any place in the world, have in this, this SAF recognized by the state where they report their SAF, their, their emissions, without the need of carrying SAF all around the planet. Because for the time being, there will be such an issue in supply that this system will allow a more democratic and more even access at a better price for airlines to sell. And that's the whole point that we are trying to put, because of course, sorry to be so, so much in the, in the details, but as you know, even with the increase of brand value as we speak, stuff is still, still 2.4 times more expensive per ton than the conventional fuel. So we are talking about a situation when in our financial situation as industry, the biggest portion of our cost, if we want to grow it, is still representing a huge, huge increase uh, of cost. So therefore, as an association, we're also fighting to have more supply, but also at a much better price than it is today. I'll stop on SAF here, and we'll move to um, the, the second part of, uh, of, of uh, I mean, not the, one of the, the, the largest pie, uh, part of the pie, which is offsetting and carbon. Carbon capture. Uh, for presentation purposes, we of course consider carbon capture as part of the offsetting effort. That's 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 an easier uh, uh, easier approach. But we, we follow this these two uh, in very close and separate ways. So of course the standard offsetting, which we always mention being a gap filler, it's it's the, just the right. It's a financial product. Yes, it's the right that you buy from another person. Uh, CO2, we are going to use it, because here is very important, but it is a gap filler. The purpose of our industry is not to have offsets, the purpose of our industry is to reduce emissions. But there is no plan of decarbonization of this industry by 2050 without a fractional usage of uh, offsets. We, we, just, we, just, we just have to be very uh, transparent on that. Therefore, no changes of the estimated reliance on offset of our industry, which is, which is, which is as you see, uh, start after 2035 to seriously be diminishing, which is due to all of the projections we have also of the increased usage of SAF. Because when the supply of SAF is going to increase, the automatic usage of offsets is going to decrease. Now, carbon capture, um, uh, utilization and storage, this technology is a technology that we very much believe in. We, we follow the, the lot of existing projects. Of course, the problem of carbon capture today, it's a national technology, which is very expensive per ton of related CO2. Now, as every technology that we know, we know that the fact that, again, airlines are creating a demand signal is going to increase the interest of investors, increase the interest of, of suppliers, and of course, then over time, decrease the price per ton. The big advantage of carbon capture, and this is why I personally, and we as a team, keep discussing, we believe in the growth of that, is that carbon capture is one of the components to produce power to liquid stuff. So one of the pathways, the proof pathways, is when you take hydrogen, you mix it with carbon, with cap carbon capture, or green hydrogen, and there is a, one factory in Germany which already produces one ton a day of 
technical checks, but the technology exists and you can find it. So with the increase on SAP, there is also going to be an increase on of carbon, carbon capture technologies because they serve as a feedstock for the for the newest uh, newest way of uh, producing uh, producing uh, power commitments. So another uh, one of the ways of SAP. In the short term, therefore, leads to um, to offset. We have Corsia. So I'm shifting to what is the short-term priorities of IATA. When I say short-term, it's literally by the end of uh, by the end of uh, October. As you know, there is currently going uh, there's, there's currently going all the formal preparations for the triennial assembly. Triennial assembly is going to start end of September by the end of October. So in about two weeks, we have the high-level meeting, which is going to be followed by the council meeting, which is going to be followed by the by the assembly. Of course, this assembly will uh, uh, work from an environment perspective, because there are other topics, uh, on two extremely important components of uh, our decarbonization plan. And Corsia, um, uh, which is the carbon offset and reduction scheme for international aviation, according to us, is now at, at, at risk. Uh, the risk comes from the fact that Corsia scheme, Corsia system was created in 2016, signed. Lots of countries, more than 104 countries, volunteered to, to offset for the first uh, so called voluntary phase. But then came COVID, which destabilized the baseline uh, on which airlines were supposed to offset. So we were supposed to have a baseline based on 2019 2020 emissions. And our industry from 2024 voluntary and from 2027 mandatory was supposed to offset above everything above uh, the baseline. The problem that we are facing today is that 2020 cannot be considered as a reference year because for each individual airlines, the baseline will change depending on COVID restrictions, which created an extremely uneven distribution of offsets and therefore. Uh, the discussion which took place in March 2020 and which keeps, uh, each, which keeps continuing uh, at ICAO, which is the discussion about what should be then the baseline if we remove 2020 uh, from the picture as a non viable uh, reference here. And here we have an extreme polarization. Our position is as I added, that we should continue at least for the whole phase, if not for the CIA, to stick to 2019, which gives an effort in, in offsetting, but also an even distribution from <coughs> continents and countries and airlines of uh, the offsetting requirements without introducing the, 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 the disparities of 20, uh, 2020. Of course, uh, we, have the, we have the vote of the Parliament on the EU Fit for 55 package, which came exactly, I believe, on 8th of June, so just a few, something like this, which created a huge disruption in, and even polarized more because the parliament created de facto an, an old European way of calculating baseline added to this ETS uh, cost. So that, that has, is not helping the global, uh, uh, global solution. And both Corsia as the next, uh, as, as the next element uh, of my presentation, which is the long-term aspirational goal, are both um, systems which IATA supports very strongly because they are global solutions versus local solutions. And for our industry, Corsia is a huge success because it's the only market-based offset measure where all the industry in the line and all of the industry has one rules and therefore this is how we want to decarbonize globally. We are very much concerned and it would be, I would say, in panic if the system uh, of offsetting was not a global system but would be a, a regional system. The long-term aspirational goal on top of Corsia, it's something we support very strongly. We would like to have a long-term aspirational goal to decarbonize aviation aligned with industry commitment. Of course, our commitment is 20, uh, 2050. Now, of course, the long-term aspirational goal is just a scenario, it's a plan. It's exactly like us. The difference would be that we have an industry commitment and we would have a state commitment with the scenarios and policy which would answer the question also of the financial efforts because at the end decarbonization will come at a cost, cost that's going to be bad by, by us airlines, by states and by all of the value chain of the, uh, of the 
application uh, industry. So those two short-term points are extremely important to us. We are conscious that negotiations will be going together for CIA and long-term aspirational goal. Same people in the same place, at the same time will be negotiating both. So we can expect some form of trade-offs between the two. Our position is for CIA 2019 baseline and uh, long-term aspirational goal um, uh, the align with the, uh, our industry uh, commitment. I will end with one ongoing challenge, which, which, which is a challenge which is going to stay with us for a couple of years as decarbonization. But after the trade of assembly, uh, the attention, and we will be going to speak more about it, is the challenge of uh, single-use uh, plastics. Um, you know, there's, I could say from a PR perspective, that there will be two challenges, decarbonizing and deplastifying. Uh, we have already had a, 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 a broad uh, general assembly discussion on decarbonization. This discussion has not happened yet on deplastifying. Um, even though more than 30 of our members have created their own deplastifying uh, de uh, strategies. Now, I will specify also that deplastifying is not means removing plastic from the constructions of the planes. That's approached by decommissioning. Uh, we, we are very much interested in by limiting and ultimately remove the single-use plastics from, uh, from the onboard uh, usage. And here happened a very good event for us because in February 22, uh, UNEP, which is the United Nations Environmental Assembly, United Environment, uh, Nations Environment Program, um, the, the UN agency which sits in Nairobi, uh, took, um, took a resolution, adopted a resolution to develop a legally binding treaty by 2020 for addressing the full life cycle of plastic from production to disposal. In other terms, this is for us a mirror type of treaty which is negotiated as we have the Paris Agreement for Decarbonization. There will be, maybe I don't know, Nairobi Treaty or something like this for plastic. And this is an extremely important element uh, for us to be part of this dialogue and bring our view and, and contribute for a very simple reason. The biggest issue we have in declassifying short term as we speak is an absolute multiplication of uh, local regulations on which plastic or which single-use plastic is considered sustainable or not sustainable, recyclable or not recyclable. This is the biggest challenge we have in, in our industry because before you remove something and you replace it, you have to define what is the plastic, what is accepted in each country, what can you use as a, as a landline, and this is, this is exactly the same approach as we have for decarbonization. We're always for global solutions against, uh, uh, against the regional uh, solution. So I, I believe that in UN there is a process, uh, a process, uh, a huge process of discussion starting. As private sector, we will be, we'll be doing all of our best to, 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 to bring our insights and, and to contribute. And I will end on uh, recognizing that we have, uh, uh, we have today a, a very special guest who joined us uh, yesterday, Sheila Agarwalkan, who sits in the first uh, row. Sheila is the Director of Economy Division of UNEP, and she's actually very instrumental uh, in, uh, in the negotiations and the discussions around this treaty. And just as we finish this meeting, Sheila will be giving a, a keynote uh, in, the, in the plenary on, on plastic, so I warmly invite you to, uh, to join us because uh, you, you won't have a more competent person on this process than, uh, than Sheila. She, she can give you all the details of how it's going to be, what it's going to be, and of course, what are the expectations for the industry because the whole game is to be, uh, is to be helpful to, to you and to have this treaty signed in two years' time. Alan here, thank you very much for listening to me, Nicola, and we can move to, to questions, I guess. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, just before we move to questions, just to remind you that uh, the last we started right after this, we'll focus on uh, CBD plastics, carbon offsets, and uh, staff as well, so make sure to attend because I think they'll answer a lot of questions you may have. Okay, who's got a question? All right, can we start here? Then we'll go here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Sebastian. Mark Penning from Green Air News. Um, Sebastian, a lot of talk about the uh, long term. Uh, what happens if, um, what's the industry's thought of what happens if it, that does not get agreed? Is there a plan B? Um, you know, that, that, that's the, the plan B on the long term aspirational goal, that's 
come of the states. So that will definitely not change the industry position of, of decarbonizing. We would be extremely disappointed because what is extremely interesting in the long-term aspirational goal is the whole technical studies that were done to measure the at least three scenarios of the long-term aspirational goal. So in the similar approach, this we have this pie chart which, which I was just sharing. Symbolically, Cape, which is a technical group supporting IKO states, has done similar scenarios, which is a really robust work of experts on what could be the decarbonization mix of technologies. But very importantly, Cape has also put the price of that. And depending on the appetite of states to commit to 2050 or some other time and what aggressive the decarbonization mix they would use more sub, less sub. Uh, there is a cost which ranges from symbolically two to four trillion dollars that would be needed by states to uh, to, de to to decarbonize. So of course the plan B would be to retry <laughs> another delta probably at another triennial assembly, but it's my personal belief is that this resolution will be taken. The question will be how aligned it's going to be with our own ambitions, because our purpose is to have an alignment so we can benefit from state support for decarbonizing aviation. Can I have time for one? Yeah, no problem. I'm not going to keep you around for sure. Yeah, please. Please follow. So how far off that alignment would you um, be happy with? 2060? 2070? So our position is 2050. So that's that's what would, would make us happy. Um, as far as it's a global agreement, we will assess after the after the assembly.
in South Africa. Um, if, if you or I don't pay our, our taxes, we can be fined and sent to jail. But this is a language that, that everybody understands. It's, it's here. Um, obviously, if, um, the issue, issue of emissions is much more complex, but, so we now have uh, here and the net zero pledge. But if the industry doesn't live up to those, those pledges, um, what legally binding mechanisms are there to, to ensure that those targets are met? <laughs> so two answers, two answers. I don't believe that any legally binding mechanism would be efficient because for our industry, what is the binding mechanism is the surveys. And I can tell you that we just did a survey among passengers and passengers, which are our customers, are, uh, are uh, requesting and expecting that airlines would be extremely active in the environment policy. And I say it uh, very gladly today because there are two topics that come back. It's decarbonization and deplastification. So uh, I think that you don't need any CEO of any airline to be motivated by jail uh, rather than by the survey which goes to the board and then makes his being or not being CEO. So that's, that's, the, that, that's, that's what I, I what, at, at least more what my experience is teaching. The second element, I would, I, I'm absolutely personal that I think it's a I can, I can speak. We are, we are absolutely against any legal uh, and punitive approach. We even consider mandates as a punitive approach because we are an association of 290 members. And each of these members has its own national policies, um, has its own priorities, its development of stages. So if we want to have a compromise, and it's all about compromises in, in our environment efforts, we are much more efficient by motivating people positively than by, by, being, uh, by being punitive. There wouldn't be Corsia agreement, which, just to remind you, 140 countries signed on a voluntary basis. I believe that much more by the pressure of citizens that wants to see movement than by any punitive, uh, any punitive approach. So there is no any dimension of legally binding element because I believe that the Pressure element is here enough and more efficient. Thank you. Thank you. There's a gentleman here. Hello, I'm Bruno Trinity Fiesico. In order to clarify your, your target, let's say that if, if we reach all the 30 billion liters in uh, 2030, mm -hmm. what percentage of the fuel consumption would that represent? First, on this, uh, on those uh, 30 billion, what would be the percentage of e kerosene uh, made with carbon and hydrogen? So the real net zero uh, fuel, in fact. And if you can give me an idea, well, what would be the impact on the price of uh, flights at that time? Wow. Okay. Uh, so I'm just doing a calculation. Uh, first of all, uh, I will start with the easy part of, of, of your answer. Hydrogen uh, or electric, uh, that's, we don't, we don't plan any. I don't mean hydrogen, I mean e-kerosene. Yeah, I know, I know. E no, so, so I'm, I'm absolutely unable to, to answer. But, uh, I don't, we will send, we will send, a, uh, we'll send a, an answer. I, I just, again, I'm, Say it. In 2030, I believe that that would represent, versus the global consumption, around five and a half to six percent of what we plan to use. But please, before you print it, let me just check with my team that because the projections that depends very much on the projections of the growth by uh, by, by 2030. But I would say it's around. Uh, it's very small. Uh, of, of course, of course, it's, it's very small. But even today, we have a limit. Of uh, in, the, in the engines, and this is by 2050, and 2050 it's 65 percent. So um, th th this is the, the whole purpose of us. And this is let's be very. Um, we believe that the real spike will come after 2035 because you need you need a, you, you need to give uh, you need to give time for those those factories to be built. So this is why we, we try to be very realistic as the other about 
what is the supply side possible? Let, let me, the, the, the problem is that, that there is no efficient way of mandatory buying something which doesn't exist because the only effect is it's going to create speculation, it's going to create pressure. Today, the airlines are reselling stuff among themselves what they need because there is, there is simply no, uh, no, uh, no supply. The answer on your question on ticket comes from the first figure, so I'll, uh, I'll connect the two, but there will be a price on decarbonization, we'll know that, and that this is at the end all that, that, we, that we want. So that's,
even if the price remains high, the commitments from airlines today are $17 billion, the equivalent of today's prices. And we expect that by 2025, I was having this on one of the slides, this commitment will reach around $30 billion. But again, long-term offering commitments are possible when you have the supply. And the biggest problem we have is when the supply uh, will, be, uh, will, be, will be available. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we'll take the gentleman in the middle there, and then we'll take one last question because we're coming to the end from the gentleman over here. Thank you. Hi, uh, Robbie Silk from Travel Weekly in the U.S. Um, so a couple questions. First of all, the, well, this is just a, the resolution you want to get would be keeping the Corsia but changing the, the goals so that it's net, net zero in 2050. I just want to clarify that it would still be under the Corsia structure. And the other question is, what do you anticipate being the most difficult uh, challenge to getting agreement with? Is it nations that would want more ambitious goals or is it nations that would want less ambitious goals, and are there any countries in particular that concern you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, Corsia as a scheme is meant to end in 2035. And today we have no visibility what's going to be in that, what's going to be the global agreement after 2035. In a nutshell, Corsia has three phases, one which is ending now in the 20, I mean now, sorry, it's ending in 2024, from 2024 to 2027. You still have phase one, which is called voluntary. So states can volunteer to participate in the offset. But then you have the second phase, which starts in 2027 and ends in 2035. Um, and this is a mandatory phase, where all the countries signatories of, uh, of the Chicago Convention, which, which is regulating Russia, and the 16, you will be have, you, you will have to participate on all international flights into the Corsia scheme. That's, that's in, a, in, a, in a national um, in the, the, the timelines. Now, the, the biggest problem, and this is what is the biggest challenge of keeping Corsia together, is to find a balance between the, the, I will use the OECD definition of what is industrialized and developing nations in terms of impact of Corsia on their own aviation systems. There are countries, um, I can quote one because it's very public, like Brazil, who is very concerned about the second phase of Corsia and is voicing it, the same voice comes, for example, from India as well. Because in Corsia, what has the, the, what the, the phase up to 2030 has a different impact of sector growth and individual growth. In other terms, the system has embedded the, the level of development of your airline system, uh, of your airline um, market, when you start paying for offset. In other terms, if you grow faster after 2030, and we know that there are nations which have, like the US, an extremely mature market, and countries which, which where those markets are structured and are extremely price sensitive. Namely, if you put a couple of dollars more on the ticket price, for the decarbonization that can make or not make the growth of the market. I'm, I'm not presenting IATA, but I'm presenting the, the arguments. So the biggest challenge is to have one global system, which we are very keen on, on keeping alive, but that allows everyone to have the feeling of fairness and the feeling that we contribute, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't impact negatively the growth of our market. This is the biggest challenge. And it's not a secret that Europe, US, Canada, Japan, uh, South Korea has extremely mature markets. But you have markets like, for example, I used to work in Africa for three years. The, there is a huge expected growth of international traffic, intra-African traffic, which is going to, if it's under Corsia, of course it's going to have a cost impact uh, in, a, in, a, in a market which is going to grow much faster than any projections we have of European or US market. That's the whole discussion. It's how much it's going to cost my nation to be part of the system, but not prevent the growth of the of the of the airline transport market. Thank you. We'll take two gentlemen over there, and we'll have to stop here, unfortunately. But if, if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to come to me or to Sebastian, who can be around. Yeah. Um, coming from the capital. 
Is Africa anywhere near the south? No. The answer is no. Uh, and this is an extremely worrying part for us. Uh, Africa, after COVID, I mean, pre-COVID was, 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 was not a big part of international traffic. Let's put it lightly, it was like two to three percent, depending on the month of the year. But Africa goes from a very low uh, denominator, but the growth is, the, is supposed to be the fastest. That's the interesting part, yeah. So, so uh, uh, particularly, you know, there are these uh, some uh, uh, agreements to become an open free market. If that happens, African market will really start um, evolving. And people, and, and again, I'm, I mentioned international traffic, so not domestic traffic, because Africa has, like, you make Nigeria a lot of domestic traffic. So, uh, this is one of the worrying parts for us is that we really need to assure that airlines in each continent have access to South. Because, because of this timeline to build sub factories, we cannot imagine that we'll be carrying sub around the planet. But you have to be able to acquire and use sub while not having sub in the geographical location yet. That's, that's, the, the, that's the biggest challenge. Uh, I'll be in um, Afghan, in Dakar, uh, very soon. So this is one of the topics which we're going to be discussing with the civil aviation authorities, which have, of course, access to, to governments, is what projects would be uh, knowing that in Africa there is plenty of interest in feedstock, uh, which would be available for South. So that's that's a, that's a real challenge. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, everyone. Uh, this concludes our briefing this morning. But again.